Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family. I'm joined by a young man who I recently met. I think we met, oh, I guess it was about a month ago. I met Matthew Snyder. And Matthew um, received his PhD in English at UC Riverside and is a continuing lecturer in the university writing program there. He's also a writer and an activist, as well as a co-host of the podcast, The Future is a Mixed Tape. And what we're going to be talking about today is his role as an executive board member for the Inland Equity Community Land Trust. And that's how we met, and that's what he was discussing. So Matthew, tell us about yourself, and let's get into Explain it to the LA Progressive uh, friends and family what uh, an econo equity community land trust is. Well, we're we're our organization is housed in what's called the San Bernardino County and Riverside County, which if it's 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 quite a large area, so it's about two point four million people. If you spread it all out, it could actually have a sports team, but it's also a very large geographical map of counties, so they're very large. And we initially, when we first started up, just talked about calling it Inland Equity instead of Inland Empire because of the colonial manifestations that was imbued in the term. So that's why it's called Inland Equity, right? Which, of course, has hedge fund language to it. So it's not divorced from any bad connotations, but equity is often being used in, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, academic university settings is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, but we wanted to use equity in that sense. And so, but the organization started really, the roots of it starts with radical friendship. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the, the, the mysteries and the unknowns that, uh, are coupled with any type of large scale protest movement is that uh, some people hang on and keep going uh, that not everybody that walks off the streets after a protest stops doing things. And I think that's one of the kind of the big mistakes journalists make about the black lives matter movement or about any social protest movement is that suddenly the protest is over and then it's over, over. But it's not actually over, over because radical friendships are forming and linking up and working on other projects that have a long term outcome and effect. So we actually uh, the 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 co-founders of it, uh, Marbal Nunez, uh, Jeff Green and I, we met at Occupy Riverside back in 2011. I was a I had just turned in my dissertation. I was working as a, a, a pre continuing quarterly lecture. I wasn't didn't have any job security at the time. I was working at UCR, and Jeff was working at a kind of a computer uh, support software um, a service system. And then, uh, you know, Meryl Banunas was part of something called the California Partnership, a nonprofit um, working on housing and healthcare. And that was really key because that was something she was working on prior to Occupy. And so that friendship formed from Occupy. And then over time, it mute, mutated into other social movements. So one thing that came out of Occupy Riverside was um, something called the 28ers. Um, uh, 28ers stands for the 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution to create a 20th Amendment to sever private wealth from politics. Oh. So, so that actually is an interstitial point between Occupy and uh, the Inland Equity Community Land Trust. And members of Occupy, once again, it didn't have any grievance-based movements. It, one, uh, I, we didn't have any clear grievances that we all all linked up. We had we we're kind of a, it's a kind of a grievance-based movement, not a solution-based movement. So it became about grievances, and it had its impact as terms of branding, like the ninety-eight percent for the one percent. But there was no solutions on the table to deal with all of these intersectional issues. Not in like intersectional imperialism like Hillary Clinton, but like actual intersectionalism in the way that it was meant and the way it's discussed within uh, black struggles. But intersections of those things was housing justice, um, health care rights, uh, student debt, um, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, police brutality. And so what I noticed with Occupy was we were always responding to the news cycles. So in every local community, over 500 different uh, en encampments, we were res ultimately responding to the news cycle, not shaping it, right? And so some of us thought that would be good to actually have a social movement around the need for exclusive public financing for all elections in the United States. And so we did monthly events from 2012 
all the way up to uh, all the way up to COVID. Actually, um, um, we were doing monthly events. I was largely organizing it, and as an organization, we we're doing events in the area that touch base with every issue in money and politics. How money and politics, the system of legalized bribery, was really destroying "quote unquote" the republic. Which, of course, there's limits to what you can do in any kind of republic. But uh, which is why anarchists are always critical of political parties and republics in terms of actual uh, rooted direct democracy. But even within the narrow framework that Madison and others had purposely narrowed uh, by disenfranchising millions of other people in the colonial U.S., is that we need to get public financing of all elections so there's no outside money in elections. So we thought that would be the actual solution to deal with multiple crisis points in the United States. And we did monthly events, but ultimately we couldn't generate the kind of energy that we wanted. We were part of something, a group called 99 Rise in L.A. area. You might have heard of that organization. I'm not sure. I did, yes. Yeah, yeah, and we were part of what was called the 28th Movement, a movement that existed but never got as nationally profiled or even termed as a 28th Movement, which is the desire for a 20th Amendment to U.S. Constitution. Organizations like Move to Amend and Wolfpack are some of the more notable organizations in that umbrella of movements, a kind of movement of movements. And it, it didn't really get anywhere because what ended up happening was Bernie ran in 2016 and blew everybody's doors off. Uh, because I, my cynical ways, like he's never gonna have enough money. You know, Americans aren't going to do anything about this. This is gonna be another third party type candidate. That's not going to get anywhere. And by running in the democratic party, even with the massive levels of blackouts, he was able to mobilize through social media and actually generate more money than he'd ever imagined. Now the campaign thought they're going to raise about $23 million. And so um, we were really excited about Bernie and actually the 28ers did the first fundraiser for Bernie Sanders in the Inland Empire. Uh, and it also it featured comedians like Jimmy Dore, who that was before he went off the deep end, um, you know, and had <laughs> created his own brown red coalition, uh, which I think is not a really good coalition to form. Um, so <laughs> so he was part of it. We had, um, you know, we did a first fund progressive Democrats of America was involved, you know, uh, to some extent. And so we were able to do the fundraiser and that was a way to kind of continue the project we did. We had a student club for a, a while and then COVID kind of collapsed all of that. And during that process, seeds were being created with Jeff and Marble and I, because they were part of the 28ers as well, is that maybe we should move to housing because we're not generating enough light and heat on this. And housing is getting worse and worse in California. And we thought, oh, this might be really good to, to do this. And so that's the germination. I mean, there's a Slate article that appeared. And I'm, once again, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a magazine that's pretty middle of the road, lib- um, lib lib um, um, a magazine, but it had an article on Bernie Sanders community land trust, the Berlin community land trust now known as the Champlain housing trust. And it blew my mind. I was like, Oh wait, this is like the coolest thing he's ever done. And I didn't even know about it. I knew him from, you know, uh, being on MSNBC and all those sorts of things. And, um, and he was like, well, it'd be cool if you could live in a country where he could be like your president. I thought that would be cool. So the seeds were planted with that. And then, when um, when he lost in 2016 to 2017, we started thinking about this and I organized a book club conversation, um, much like the Black Panthers, right? You know, as Howardson said, education can and should be um, dangerous. Uh, we I started with a book club. Uh, not, not that I'm comparing myself to the Black Panthers <laughs> who are legendary in terms of their commitment to social justice and economic justice and racial justice, but that I, I was stunned by the fact that it started from something as banal as a book club. And we picked a book called Jackson Rising. Um, it was an anthology of essays uh, that uh, featured Kali Okuna and others um, in Jackson, Mississippi. And it it reached deeper in my soul than just like land and housing and creating housing for middle class people. It was speaking to like the socialist communist horizon and and the way that 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 black folks in Jackson, Mississippi were actually creating their own freedom. Right. And the yeah, crazy... I think I, I think that book is on my shelf behind me. Oh, the first 40 pages are amazing. Yeah. Um, they... Go ahead. So, so, so let's talk um, for the, for those who are listening and are, are not familiar with land trusts. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the land trust, but let me just ask you this. I, I done, I had done a little bit of research on you and I saw on your bio, it mentioned the 28ers, yeah. and, but the website is gone. 
Do you, do you know what happened with the content? Oh, so on- I just, so we, we have to change platforms. It's, it, it's still in Facebook. So Facebook is oh. where most things are posted, okay. so, but it, it's, it's not really, I mean, I was largely running the show as a kind of a grassroots organizer and you know how hard it is to be a grassroots organizer. Uh, it's an extremely uh, time consuming affair. And so after COVID, we couldn't do monthly events and we we're doing monthly events every 28th of the month symbolizing the 28th amendment and we wanted that to spread throughout the united states but we could never really get outside of you know riverside or san Marino because organizing grassroots organizing is so difficult it's yes, one thing it to show up but one thing it's it's like how do you actually create grassroots organizers because most organizers are paid or they're work they're, they're organizing at their own workplace and i think this is increasingly the thing that i realized in my failures with 28ers was we don't have grassroots organizers, but how can we create them? Because they're actually the missing link. For they are the missing link. They're, they're the missing so. link. And and what I've observed is that they are either very young and um, are in college and don't have the financial or yep. economic responsibilities yep. that they're going to have when they you know have children, or they're like my age or my husband's age, where yep. we've already raised our children and we're empty nesters. And so we can afford to uh, devote yeah. time and effort into this. And so we've been publishing the LA Progressive for 16 years. And the, I'd say the first dozen years, we didn't make a dime. Yep. Um, and we paid for it completely out of our own pocket. Yep. So um, I think I that's to- a missing glue. I agree. Because it, it, even in 28ers, the people that we typically had were students or they were retirees. And you see this yeah. also with um, the Met- the Medicare for All fight in California with mm-hmm. what was called SB 562. Routinely, mm-hmm. you didn't have middle-aged people. You didn't have people in their early 30s. It was just either retirees or uh, really like really aware and conscious young people. And that's not really healthy for an, a movement. <laughs> you need it a, isn't. It diverse. isn't. So, so, I mean, so first of all, you have to have an awareness that that's who's going to show up and it's consistent. I've been seeing mm-hmm. it consistently for many years. Yep. So once you have that awareness, then you have to strategize about, well, what to do about it, because yep. it's absolutely a legitimate issue and it's um, un- completely understandable. People with young children and working mm-hmm. already are exhausted. They mm-hmm. certainly don't have time to volunteer. So I thought that um, the media, um, especially independent media, the role that we could serve is to at least provide content for those people with the young mm-hmm. kids and and the mm-hmm. jobs and so that they can, when their time comes, because it will come when those kids are now not needing to, a, a soccer mom to drive them around to their soccer games, the time will come. And if we've provided them with enough information, they will, that my 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 goal is they will be um, ready and willing to take action. So speaking of information, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about what is a land trust. And then I want you to talk about the future is a mixtape and all of that content. That- you have there oh yeah so uh so the community land trust is i the best way that i can talk about it is medicare for all for housing so Mm -hmm. as a as a as a communist lowercase c as a social anarchist as someone who believes that uh the revolution will come from the community not from the political parties is uh and it's very much in keeping with murray bookchin and others Uh, some people like anarcho syndicalist would say you know it's going to come from the workplace i don't know we have so many people unemployed or not working that's pretty small to create a revolution. So I think ultimately you have to look at the revolution happening alongside the community. So what meets the community's basic needs right now is the right to housing. The right to housing is other than healthcare, it might be superseding the healthcare crisis in California uh, is the housing crisis in California. And so what what community land trusts do is they partially decommodify, which means they take land out of the market. It's kind of what you call recommoning. So instead of the enclosure movement, which happened at, to, to begin the process of capitalism from feudalism, you're recommoning land that used to be private and putting mm. under community ownership. So you're you're recommoning 
Um, and everything has been relentlessly privatized, 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 cut the entire planet, the ecosystem into little parcels. And then there's nothing left over. And because it's so individualized, we get kind of the prisoner's dilemma, which is talked about in economics, where I, you're, I'm supposed to be rational, but if everybody's cooperating, I don't have to cooperate. It won't mean anything. And so this intense privatization of everything, air, water, all this, the CLT is a way to actually, hey, let's recommend the most basic fundamental thing, which is the land. And the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, unfortunately, died right when the beginning of Jackson Rising said that to free, in order to free ourselves, we have to free the land. And that spoke to me because the 28ers wasn't able to build community power because we weren't, we're talking abstractly about a bureaucratic tragedy, which is the for profit funding of all elections. And it wasn't reaching people because it's a bureaucracy. But on talking about a material everyday circumstance where you're working along a collaborative project that meets people's needs by putting the land under community ownership is a big thing. And so what the arrangement of it is essentially like this. So, and every CLT has its own arrangement. The land is put under a community ownership structure under the 501c3 and uh, you own the house. The person owns the house. Uh, when they buy the house, they buy the house, not the land. And if we see in California, the hyper speculation of the housing market is the land. 50% of capitalism is land. So rent is still very much part of the process here uh, of extraction on people. As Alice Walker once famously said, you know, oh, 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 humans are the only creatures on the planet that have to pay rent to live, right? Um, and so it, by putting the land under common stewardship, we prevent gentrification. We prevent treating land like a baseball card that's hid away and hoarded. And then the person buys the house and they make payments on the house or get a loan from us or another bank. And then they pay off that house and build equity. It's like they're sitting on a bank account, but they can't make money off the land itself. The land stays in it. And what often is with the arrangement is when the house is sold, it has to be sold with the land attached to it. So when you're buying it, you're only buying the house and you, you agree to these, what do you call MOUs, uh, these agreement uh, stipulations about how it happens. And what ends up happening is, as a result of that, CLTs can use the land, the equity generated from its market value to build more homes and uh, give grants to people. So adjusted to the price of the market, it's actually more affordable adjusted to inflation uh, of the of the price price inflation to each new person that buys the home. So it's a permanent affordability vision. And what it ends up being is something where everybody has a right to housing and you can integrate it racially, economically, financially, spiritually. So when did the um, the um, ECLT, the In Inland Equity Community Land Trust, when did it start? And you said you have some pictures that you're going to since I'll send some photos. Yeah, we'll send some photos of it uh, over the time we kind of collected information because we know the legacy becomes very important for movements. Uh, and so uh, we started, so we had that book discussion in 2017 over Jackson Rising. Didn't go anywhere initially. And then Marble and Jeff got together with me um, at the Mission Inn, which is a famous kind of colonial, you know, mystical little place. It's a hotel that's whimsical in its designs, but has a whole history of colonialism and all that stuff. And we actually met in that that area. It was called the Presidential Suite, uh, which is a bar in the area. And we said, maybe we should move from healthcare to housing for the California Partnership, because she was working on that. And maybe we should create a CLT, because I was talking about well, this is something we should do. Um, this is the, something we do to build, you know, co you know, socialism from below, right? And we both agreed to have a nice meal. And then we went through the process of creating a nonprofit. And it really started to take off in 2020. That's when we had our 51C3 status. And then about a six months or eight months into that, uh, we got a Facebook message, uh, most important message of my life, that uh, a woman by the name of Kleinman uh, wanted to uh, – give us uh, 20 acres for a hundred thousand dollars. This is in 2020. And this is during COVID during a pandemic when housing would became a really crucial thing with no income and all that. And she said, my, my father, my brother had died and I have 20 acres in the Adelanto San Bernardino mountains region of the San Bernardino County. And I would like to sell it to a CLT. Are you a CLT that works in the Inland empire area? I can give you 20 acres for a hundred thousand dollars, which is an incredibly good price given what it was selling for. And she wanted it to go to housing, especially with COVID and, and the housing 
uh, crisis. So we did two fundraisers. Um, initially, the first fundraiser was to to raise twenty uh, percent, basically twenty thousand dollars, to do the down payment for the CLT. And California, California partnership changed to being the Inland Equity Partnership, and now part of the and it sits under the IECLT. And then we did the fundraisers. We got the loan. And then uh, later on, we got a grant from the state of California of a million dollars uh, to uh, buy the land outright and continue instruction. And then we got an additional one point five million from Lendonate, Lendonate, which um, is a charity investor, angel investors, and they gave us one point five million because the four homes we're going to build are going to cost approximately about one. I, the whole production of all of this, uh, the homes are going to cost roughly two hundred fifty, two hundred eighty thousand dollars each, and so we needed a little bit more than a million, and so. So we now have the nested funds. We had the gala fundraiser uh, uh, this uh, last month and well, April 20th. And, uh, and we were, we were able to raise more mon money and we're going to build more homes. And on these 20 acres, this is where we're going to maybe move away from Champlain housing trust and Bernie Sanders is, is building a solidarity economy, which means, um, uh, you're not just building housing, you're building worker and consumer cooperatives. You're doing solar and farm and wind on those 20 acres. And you're having a conversation what the future looks like on the 20 acres. And it was an epiphany to me because I'm 47 now, you know, 2011, I was much younger. And when we were at Occupy, we were doing a dollhouse version of this, uh, mm -hmm. a theater of this. And yeah. um, a, a student of mine was doing this with uh, at UCR when she was uh, leading in the encampment for SJP, uh, Students for uh, Justice for Palestine. They had an encampment and I was just touched and moved. I actually cried a little bit because I saw the little bookstore, the little food market. I was like, yeah. oh, it's like a little miniature city. It's a yeah. common city. Yeah, that's, that's, that, was, that was my experience too. Dick and I used to go to um, the Occupy uh, encampment downtown Los Angeles, around mm -hmm. Los Angeles City Hall. And we loved being down there. It became a little miniature community, you know. You, like you, Utopia, you had, right? Yeah. It, 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 it was kind of, kind of. I mean, there were times when things weren't always pleasant. Oh, sure. But one problem was rats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because you because you're doing the temporary utopia without the infrastructure underneath it. Right. Yeah. And of course, you have the personalities involved and you have ego and tensions and all the frailties in, and um, fra uh, uh, all the frailties and, and problems of humans are going to go wherever you go. You're not right. going to have a perfect movement. There is no perfect social movement or protest movement. They're going to have mess. They're going to be messy, just like humans. But yeah. what was interesting about this is. We were doing a theater and symbolically thinking that we had power, but when we were doing the, the occupation in downtown Riverside, where we had tents out back in 2011 and things, we were pretending we were free, but we weren't really free. No. We were doing a theater version of it. But these 20 acres, we're going to have maybe a cafe, a movie theater, a grocery store. We're going to have a, a wind farm, solar farm using low-tech technology ecological housing. So we're going to be doing all the things that we wanted, but we actually own the land. <laughs> you know, you know. And, and how, how, do, how do people get involved? I'm sure you, you want this community to grow. Yeah. So we have a membership system. Um, people can go to Inland Equity. Uh, so it's uh, Inland Equity CLT dot org. I think mm -hmm. it's Inland Equity CLT dot yeah, org. I'm on it. I'm on it. I can see it right now. It's yeah. And so I don't, I have to, I'll have to ask Jeff we had a membership tab, but I'm not sure what that's at. And, um, you know, I, I, the thing is too, is to build community. I don't want it to all be just about like another fundraiser. Like, so for instance, I were thinking about maybe showing the movie Florida project, which is an amazing film about, um, interracial poverty, mostly white poverty in Florida, uh, of people that are renting a motel. And it's about a single mother who can't afford her rent and the things she has to do in order to uh, keep her child with her in this kind of motel slash, you know, low income housing area. It's called the Florida project. And that story is all about the lack of housing. You know, it's like, the, it's like the um, joke on the memes for um, uh, Brian Cranston and that uh, a famous TV show, TV show. What was it called? Brian Cranston. Breaking Bad. Breaking yeah, Bad. Yeah, where it's like, okay, he moves to Canada. The story's over. And, you know, if the story of Florida project is if, you know, she had, had lived in a city that had a CLT story over. She wouldn't have the tragedy that happened with her family yes, as a result yes. of that. So this is kind of the thing. It's like we have films about things 
that didn't have to exist in the first place because they haven't built the institutions that would sustain those things. And yeah. I think of CLTs as a third space, you know, like you talk about, you know, the workplace in the home and we need third places. It's a third space, not just for human connection and belonging, but also it's a third space for a revolution because we have the protests, we have the street protests, we have electoral politics, but this is a third space between street protests, between electoral politics that might be the missing glue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing I noticed when we were very engaged with the Occupy movement in downtown Los Angeles, it really became clear to me the lack of the comments. We didn't have a common space and we were always under threat that the police mm -hmm. were going to come and clear out the Occupy yep. uh, encampment. And they, in fact, did that. Yep. Um, and so that's that was one thing that I remember thinking, ah, you know, there was a there was a time I, I can remember in the days of old where there was a um, a town square, and in yes. the town square you'd have the big clock, and you know I'm I'm thinking yeah. of um, that's Martin, totally uh, out of Naomi Klein's No Logo. That was one of her big points in the her break, big breakout work of nonfiction No Logo is that we've lost the comments and that our brands yeah. are just turned into retail. That's right. That's right. Everything has been commodified and privatized, and mm -hmm. there's no uh, public uh, anything. Yeah. So, which, uh, which of course has taken away our voice. Absolutely. So now, I, so I, so now let's, let's go on and let's talk about uh, your your podcast, which I just think is just so interesting. I was taking a look at that. Um, let me go back to where I was. The future is a mixtape. Mix mm -hmm. So tell me, the future is a mixtape. Where did the term come from? How often the, do you the, do the, your the, podcast? The term came from an essay that I had squabbles with the editor over, and I ended up not publishing. Uh, based off a, a science fiction novel by Ada Palmer called To Like the Lightning. And I was writing on, an, an essay on that that was going to be published. And I kind of disagreed with the edits. And so I just kind of walked away from it. But I liked the phrase. And my friend and comrade, Jesse, uh, liked the term because he said that's the perfect term for what the future would look like. The future isn't just something that's whole cloth. It's made of a mixtape of the past, the present, and the future. And then if we're going to arrive at utopia, we can't ignore the past, can't ignore the present. So we're going to take what we want from the, the, the entire arc of human history and build a mixtape that looks like the future. And the future is going to have things that are similar from the past, right? Which is the commons, right? We, you know, the commons existed prior to capitalism. And it will, we're, if we have socialism, the, the, you know, private land won't really be a thing. You know, um, and so it's a mixtape is that's the idea. And so the the podcast is a, what we call a grad school for radicals. The podcast is about being very accessible, like like dying the wool anarchists of making language accessible for everyone, not using heavy Marxist language and making accessible frameworks for talking about things. So the golden square is one of the key ideas of the podcast, which is that we need a entire global society where we all have the rights to food, shelter, health care, and education. We call that the golden square. And that every human on the planet has deserves the universal provision and equal provision of food, shelter, health care, and education. And when someone says, are you a socialist? I'm like, yeah, I'm a socialist. But that just means not government takeover. It means that everyone has the right to food, shelter, health care, and education. And that's an outgrowth of the golden rule. That's where the phrase golden comes from. The mm -hmm. golden rule is don't do to others what you don't want to have done to you. I don't know about you, but my daughter deserves food, shelter, health care, and education. This kid randomly on the street, this Palestinian child, food, shelter, health care, and education. And when we map up to colonial violence and imperialism, we're looking once again at land, right? That I can make you subhuman because you don't have a right to the land, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And your rights as a human is based on property ownership, not based on the intrinsic beauty of your body, your consciousness, and your waking uh, mouth. Your, the things that come out of your mouth, the things you say, those things have no value because it's all constituted by who gets to hoard the land. And so from Palestine to Riverside, these connections are there. And so the podcast is really about explaining how we do these things. And I think one of the approaches on the left is we can get, we can get into these these interfractional parties fights, these partisan fights about where we do it from the state level or the local level. And it's a false binary. Depending on what the project is, some things are going to be more local. 
some things are going to be more uh, electoral and national. So for instance, um, we've talked about in the podcast how food and housing are be better done on an anarchist level, you know, from below horizontal formations when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, you know, co-ops with food, cons consumer cooperatives and housing, that's best done on the local level. Now, when it comes to education and healthcare, healthcare is extremely capital intensive. We need Medicare for all, you know, give me a break. We need Medicare for all. Like that's a 20th century idea. You're, you know, this is crazy. A 20th century idea. The United States hasn't even arrived at a 20, 20th century idea. So we need that. And education is expensive, not as expensive as the war in Ukraine or the endless bombing of Palestinians uh, and the genocide there. But also, you know, these are capital intensive. So we do need to capture the state, but we, that's not it. It's not just capturing the state. We also need to do these other things. And that's why I like the CLT project, because the CLT project creates its own stories. When we put four people in housing this summer, in July, we're going to be completing the construction of the first four homes. We have created a story. We are the story. We're the people, right? It's housing for the people by the people. So how do you get your story out? How do you get people to listen to your podcast? I mean, how do people know about the Inland Empire uh, Community Land Trust? Well, the website, we have a Facebook page. I don't remember if we, 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 we're not as social media savvy as we could because most of us are Gen Xers. So, you know, like Jeff Marble and I are from the Gen X generation. So we're not as media savvy, but we have the website, Inland Equity Community Land Trust. Uh, the Future of the Mixtape is streaming on all uh, platforms. So uh, Apple, Spotify, Google, I think Google Player, I think it's called. And mm -hmm. so you can find on a variety of uh, social media platforms. The website, thefuturesmixtape.com is kind of, um, where Jesse and I, a friend of mine, has have been making these episodes available. Um, the most recent episodes are about the the world of the Golden Square. Like, how do you actually make the Golden Square apply yeah, I see to that. the entire planet? I see that. That's episode number 52, the world of the Golden Square, part three, structures and ecologies. And you've yeah. got a lot of very interesting titles here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link. Um, so we're going to wrap this up. I try to keep these interviews to like 15 minutes. Yeah. Because people uh, and but I want to put a link to sure. uh, the future is a mixed mixtape and it also a link to the Inland Empire um, Community Inland Land Equity. Trust. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I want to stay in touch because yeah. I'm very interested and also would like to join as a member. I do. You do have the membership. Um, yeah, I, I, I have to. I, that reminds me, I have to touch base with Jeff. And I think what I think this is frustrating to me because not every area can do this as successfully because. The LA is so tough because there's so much capitalism in the yeah. city. It makes yeah. it tough to do a CLT. So it's not that you can do it everywhere. You can do it in the areas where capitalism is uneven. So for us, R Riverside and San Diego has a lot of empty land, a lot of empty mm -hmm. land. So mm -hmm. that gives us the ability to leverage social movements mm -hmm. to buy land. Whereas mm -hmm. in the city of Los Angeles, you've got the super capitalists the vampires right. that just in the, own the city. city but the, but LA County has a lot of land you know part yeah, of the yeah. land yes, so that's part of uh, that's part of uh Los Angeles County all yeah, the way out the county to, you know, absolutely Angeles. yeah mm -hmm. I was this, thinking more of the different. problems of the city like LA like oh, LA would be so amazing if it was just a, a citywide CLT you know the whole city of LA oh my god there would be no you know no problems with housing yeah yeah but we got a lot of work to do well, Matthew, we I just want to thank you for, for joining us and thank you for sharing this information. I'm going to be uh, publishing this 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 um, this interview and also including the links. I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Is yeah. there anything that you want to say as we wrap up? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll provide contacts as well for if you want to reach out to me and want to start up your own CLT to build a solidarity economy, well, co consumer cooperatives, worker cooperatives, uh, and CLTs. We've got to get the land back. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks again so much, Matthew. And we'll be talking again sometime soon. Matthew Snyder, everybody. So long. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.